Okay, hello everybody, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are around the world. My name is Herbert Jelinek and I'm going to present to you today a little bit about the mental health challenges that we're facing during the COVID-19 pandemic. Hopefully I'll come up with some answers and uh, it'll make sense to you. It's going to be a little bit of a light-hearted uh, presentation with some facts thrown in. So my presentation basically is about, first of all, I'm going to give you a little bit of an account of a personal experience by a pharmacist in the United States. Uh, I'll have the link there for you so that you can check out what she actually says. There's a lot more to it. I'm going to talk a little bit about anxiety and depression uh, that's found in worldwide in terms of numbers. I'm going to quickly go over the mental health issues in the UAE, again, mainly in numbers, and then I'm going to look at ways of combating mental health issues in this time by looking at a particular method called neurofeedback and uh, I'm going to introduce you to some neurofeedback research in mental health. Then we're going to look at some mobile apps that you might want to consider using at home or at work and then I'm going to finish up with some research that we've been doing at Khalifa University in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. So this is now a survivor account by uh, Sandra Crosby from uh, the United States. She says that uh, she actually had the, the virus, she said it was terrifying, hallucinations came up, loneliness and anxiety. And following from her bout with COVID-19, she was saying that she felt fear, anxiety, helplessness, hopelessness, a low mood, she felt guilt, uh, she didn't know uh, how she got infected and uh, she followed the masking routine, shielding, gloving, hand washing. She still ended up with the virus and then of course uh, she was also feeling guilty about uh, or worried about passing it on to other people. And what she then says is that the toll of COVID-19 on mental health compounded by quarantine, isolation and uncertainty cannot be overstated. And I think that's the main message that I'm getting at today that a lot of us are dealing continuously with this idea of quarantine, isolation and the uncertainty uh, about the impact of COVID-19 that nobody knows. You don't, nobody really knows what the long-term impact is on people that have uh, been infected. Nobody knows what the COVID-19 impact is uh, over time, in the next year, in the next month, over, no one really knows and that uncertainty is bringing about a lot of anxiety and a lot of stress in many, many people, which is understandable. Now, William James uh, lived in 1842 to 1910. One of the things that he said was a very famous psychologist, what he said is that the greatest weapon against stress is our ability to choose one thought over another, which is true, but what I'm going to suggest is that you need a little help from your friends. So depending on the level of stress or anxiety or depression that you are feeling, you may not necessarily have the ability to put another thought in your head that may overcome the one that brings about the stress and the anxiety. And again, I say that uh, biofeedback, which I talked about a number of weeks ago, and neurofeedback or mindfulness, is a way that calms the brain so that, uh, and the body so that you may be able then to come up and choose thoughts that get you out of this cycle of anxiety or stress. So if we have a look at mental health and the worldwide depression and anxiety, this is a, uh, uh, a guide here and uh, basically what it says to you is anxiety disorders are quite a common uh, neurological or psychological disorder followed by depression, alcohol disorders, uh, drug use disorders, bipolar, schizophrenia and eating disorders. So quite, this is in 2017, so quite an uh, extended massive portion of illness is due to mental health. Uh, worldwide statistics, if you have a look at that on anxiety, it was estimated in 2017 that there were 264 million people around the globe affected by anxiety and the prevalence of all mental health disorders increased by 50% um, from 1990 to 2013. So in 20, in 20 years, it doubled basically, or again, increased by 50%. And I think we can again expect that this is now 
much more exasperated because of the pandemic. This is a, a, a change of anxiety disorders now in the UAE and as you can see here from 1990 to 2017 there was quite a dramatic rise in anxiety from around 100,000 people in the UAE to well over 400,000 and this is again in uh, 2017 and I just show here this uh, uh, point here 2005 around that time we had a number of interesting world events that led to this spike in anxiety one was the SARS pandemic that came out also Sheikh Nan Zayed uh, died in 2004 and then we had the global financial crisis in 2008 so you can basically say that now in 2020 you'll end up seeing another spike like this associated with now the um, COVID-19 pandemic. So we would expect a fairly big rise in mental health problems. Uh, again, global burden of disease. Again, looking at the UAE in 2017, I just want to highlight here that uh, mental uh, health issues are listed here about uh, um, fifth down the line at 180,000 compared to cardiovascular disease at 200. 67,000, but if you take into consideration, for instance, uh, a number of these other associated um, conditions such as self-harm, which is around the 30,000, and you add it to the 180, that gives you 210,000, which is pretty probably about the third in line in terms of the, the burden of disease in the UAE, third in line in the UAE in 2017 and again my premise is that it's probably gone up a fair bit since then. So what, what about the mental health issue in COVID-19? Um, when we look at the uh, impact of COVID-19 the question is how did we get here and this particular slide now just mentions a number of these and one of them that I'm pointing, highlighting here is that the lack of mental health assessment and self-judgment methods, you know, there's a lack of these, so there's not enough mental health assessment and also there's a uh, uh, kind of uh, separation in terms of how well people can judge their own mental health because there's a lack of education in this area as well and also a lack of physical and mental health knowledge is important so people really don't understand, a lot of people really don't understand what mental health issues are about and how they manifest and then what they can do about it, what services they can see. So these are just a number of um, issues that brought about the mental health crisis that we're experiencing during this time of COVID-19. A study by Rega uh, just recently in Yama reports that there's uh, suicide mortality again, how come we're seeing more of that and so when we look at the issues they include economic stress, social isolation, decreased access to community and religious support, decreased availability of mental health services, increased medical problems such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, outcomes of uh, the national anxiety. So if, if you look at maybe the United States or Brazil there's really uh, quite a s widespread anxiety in terms of uh, COVID-19. And then there's also something I'm going to talk about a little uh, later on, which is health anxiety. So what is health anxiety? I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Now solutions, well, one of the big best ways or big solutions that you can have is to stay connected. So meaningful relationships. You can do this by Zoom, by telephone, any which way, uh, because Social isolation doesn't necessarily mean that you're always going to have a distance isolation. So you can actually get in touch with people in many different ways. Uh, telemental health is something that many countries have now brought about. So if you do have mental health problems, you can contact uh, hospitals or uh, mental health providers and they can then uh, get you in touch with psychiatrists or psychologists or mental health social worker that you can discuss your uh, issues with. There's also a number of phone line helplines that you can access. Uh, there needs to be an increased access to health care. So as we all know, when uh, the pandemic was really at its peak, many of the hospitals were totally flooded with uh, COVID-19 patients and there wasn't really a lot of room for anybody else. And many people 
people then decided not to go to hospital because they were worried that they were actually going to get COVID-19. So where you usually have uh, continuous care for people, for instance, with kidney disease or diabetes, well, they would stay away from hospitals and hence their disease in some instances got worse. And again, so distance-based uh, suicide prevention is another uh, solution that we can implement again through, say, telemedicine. And then uh, an important one, which I'm also going to address in my mind, is uh, media reporting. And this uh, slide here is about the uh, infodemic, which it's called. So it's this issue where the media is just bombarding people continuously with numbers going up, going down, going sideways every day, all day. You don't hear anything else about there are, uh, anything in the world apart from COVID-19. And so that's certainly one issue. And, and this can be from accepted uh, news providers. So it can be you know, BBC, uh, Euronews, uh, Al Jalila, any of those. But it's the continuity of this reporting and usually just one-sided reporting that creates uh, anxiety, stress, depression in the population. There are some good sites to go to where you do get some good numbers. So for instance, the Johns Hopkins Medical site is good if you wanted to sort of follow what the uh, World Health uh, is doing in terms of uh, COVID-19 and also the World Health Organization is another one. But what is even more prevalent, if you, you know, if you know you've got BBC, you've got CNN, you've got Sky News, you know, you've got Al Jalila, so you've got a whole number of these reputable news sites. Well, social networking sites, there's 65 plus of these, so they outnumber many of the more reputable media sites. And the seven biggest ones, for instance, that are uh, mentioned uh, at the moment, it would be Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, Snapchat, Pinterest, and Reddit. And they just pump out information and they and it's not necessarily always correct. The people put in their own thoughts, their own um, ideas, and hence if you start reading these, it would certainly not help your mental health condition. And so that's, that's um, a big problem, this infodemic that we are now caught up in with everybody having smartphones and immediate access to many different types of information. So this brings me to this idea of health anxiety. And there's funny enough, two parts to health anxiety. One is that I mentioned here that it's characterized by catastrophic misinterpretation of bodily sensation and changes, dysfunctional beliefs about health and illness, and maladaptive coping behaviors. And it gets exasperated by much of the media. So that's a negative aspect about health anxiety. But another type of negative aspect about health anxiety is if you think you're doing okay and it's not going to affect you. So health anxiety can have a negative impact in terms of uh, increasing infection rates. So we've come across this. If you sort of feel, uh, you know, it's not going to get me, I'm okay. What we've seen in the 2009 influenza pandemic is that this kind of low risk view of you actually being uh, susceptible to infection was that uh, hand washing was less likely to occur. Uh, there was less vaccination, so people didn't seek vaccination because they thought, I'm not going to get the flu anyway. Uh, there was less, it was unlikely there was going to be any change in social behavior and disregard of any recommendation for social distancing or any other government um, uh, directives that were brought about. And I think, if I have to say it, well, in the media, you would have come across uh, a lot of that information where people disregarded um, uh, simple directives from governmental sources and that brought about um, increases in infection. So health anxiety is a very important component of what's going on at the moment. And again, uh, my premise is that if you can be mindful by using, for instance, biofeedback or neurofeedback, it'll bring about that you have better uh, decision-making competency. So again, coming back to prevalence of depression and why I'm keeping pushing this, is that this was a study done in, uh, in China and they were looking at this uh, media, how much social media are people uh, uh, involved with. And you can see here that uh, the 
on the right hand side is if the social media involvement had a if you like an effect on them and in what in what state and then on the left hand side is if it didn't have an effect or a negative effect if you like the middle line here means that it had no effect so for instance if you self-rate your health as being poor watching social media sites you will have a, an adjusted odds ratio that is much greater of thinking that you're going to get infected with COVID-19 and so you're much more likely to have depression if you see yourself already in terms of a uh, low general health and you frequently uh, uh, look into the various social media sites. There's also shown to be an effect in terms of age groups. So here we can see that the 21 year to 40 year old uh, population is much more, uh, shows much more depression if you like, due to being uh, uh, more maybe social media savvy, using it more often. So it tends to have a much greater effect and that's interesting because if you're looking at the, um, for instance, rurality, living in a rural area versus uh, metropolitan area, you can see that uh, people in the rural area are usually less depressed. Okay? And so one of the reasons for that could be that they may be using less social media. So social media can have quite an effect, as you can see here, on depression, for instance. And it does depend, however, as I said, on uh, age. It also has an effect in terms of education. So the higher or the better your education is, the less effect it would have, the less likely you would have depression. If you, say, for instance, have a college degree or a high school uh, degree, that would then also influence whether you are more or less likely to experience depression. So bear that in mind. If you're going to be using Flickr or Facebook or any of those, make sure that the information that you're getting is actually trustworthy. Okay. So more about the same. Uh, just let me highlight a number of these things here. Uh, in terms of mental health or in terms of anxiety, depression and neurological disorders and neurological symptoms, a study in China in Wuhan found that uh, patients that recovered from uh, COVID-19, 36.4% showed neurologic symptoms. Another study looking at anxiety, depression and stress comparing Asia and Europe also found that both countries showed about a 30% um, stress, anxiety and uh, depression prevalence. And uh, the third study that I just wanted to show you here, which is in hospitalized patients in Italy, there were 725 people in this study. 59% reported an altered mental state, so depression, anxiety, uh, whilst they're in hospital and following uh, their release from hospital. 31% of those uh, experienced a minor stroke, 12% ended up having headaches, 9% presented with seizures and 4% with dizziness. This is all patients with COVID-19, so there certainly seems to be a neurological impact that this uh, virus may have. And, um, as you're probably aware of, uh, some studies have shown, for instance, that um, you end up uh, losing uh, your sense of smell, which means that the virus may as well affect your nervous system and affect, say, for instance, your nerves that play a role in smell, and then also may be able to then go and affect your central nervous system, your brain. So this next uh, slide here is about what are we doing about mental health in the era of COVID-19. This comes from the Epicenter uh, data and uh, previously I showed this here on the 16th of June. You can see here mental health, uh, not a great deal being done about it. Well, as of August the 3rd, not much more, not much more has been actually uh, reported and or researched in mental health. So again, mental health even though it seems to play a very important role in health and in, in population health, it just doesn't seem to kind of impact much in terms of promoting more research uh, in, in this particular area. And per usual, what we can see here, much of it is about diagnosis and case reports that we see a lot about. 
So this needs to change, this mental health research needs to change. But in terms of it not changing, what can you do about it? And this is basically what my um, presentation today is about. So um, just here, a Lancet Psychiatry by uh, Holmes in 2020 did come up with a call of action. And one of the things that they were saying is that uh, mechanisms, so mechanisms, coping strategies, and preventative interventions can be used, right? especially to support vulnerable groups under any kind of condition, including pandemic conditions. And there should be some methods for promoting more successful adherence to behavioral advice. And again, if you're anxious, stressed, depressed, uh, the likelihood of you actually adhering to behavioral advice is much lower than if you are more healthy in terms of mental health. So how does that then fit in in terms of what the demand is? And when we had a look at this over time, there's a study by Luo in 2020 in psychiatric research, what we find is that 50% of the study participants accessed psychological resources through books or media. And so this is where we can then make an impact. Also, people with mild or lower disturbances prefer to obtain such services from media sources. And in here, I want to sort of uh, also now include uh, apps, so smartphone apps. You know, so people go to these apps, uh, and there's hundreds of these around, and I'm going to mention a couple of those. So in terms of when you're uh, mild or moderate, um, affected and you think, oh yeah, I'm a bit stressed today, well then you can do things uh, to alleviate this and not let it sort of become worse and so that you may then avoid seeking psychiatric or psychological help. So what can therefore be done? Uh, and my premise is that using neurofeedback or mindfulness might be one way of looking at mental health and improving or maintaining good mental health. Now, how does neurofeedback work? Well, what we know is that the brain has um, a number of, uh, has electrical activity, and the electrical activity can be divided up. And so we have here, as you can see, beta waves, alpha waves, they're called theta waves, delta uh, waves, etc., and theta waves. So when you have this type of beta wave, we know that you're very active. If you have alpha waves, you're more relaxed. Theta waves is when you're really relaxed and you're meditating. And then, for instance, if you have delta waves, it's usually synonymous with sleeping. So hence, what we know is that if a person is highly stressed, there will be more beta waves. So how can I then make these people less stressed? How can I help them become less stressed? Well, the way that I can do that is by promoting more theta wave activity or more alpha wave activity. Right? So that's the way that we can address this. Now the question is, how is this done? How can I change this? How can I change the brain's pattern, the electrical activity that all these neurons in your brain come up with? And the way that it's done is that you can have some sensors on your, on your scalp here, you know, maybe one or several, there's a number of ways of doing this. And these sensors record your brain waves. They record your electrical activity. And in the computer here, we say to the computer, if the person is showing lots of beta waves, dim the screen. So that means that when you're looking at a screen and you're watching a movie, the movie will dim and you can't see it very well or the screen gets smaller. You don't have to do anything. If the computer records more, say, alpha or more theta waves, the screen will be more, uh, it won't dim as much or will be enlarged again so you can see it easier. And so you just sit there and watch the screen, your favorite movie, Try not to watch a cowboy movie or some sort of gunslinging movie. Try to watch something a little bit more benign. And then uh, the computer will record your brain waves. And through the interaction with the computer screen, your brain will learn that, oh, you know, the screen will show up if I do this. You, don't, you can't force it. You can't say to the brain, oh, 
just relax now because I want to watch the movie. That's not going to work because it's just going to stress you out. So all you've got to do is just relax and just watch the movie and let the brain do its own learning. That's what neurofeedback is about. You can, however, and I'll talk a bit about that a little later on, you can also help it in a little way and that is by breathing. So that's this mindfulness breathing, resonant breathing it's called because there are neurons that are connected with the heart and the um, lungs that then feed up information to the brain and actually help the brain to calm down. So this would then also work together with neurofeedback and I'll explain a little bit more about this breathing in a moment. Now why does this work? Well because the when we have this feedback, as I was saying, up to the brain through this um, neurofeedback that we're doing, what we what happens is is that this uh, mainly this amygdala, it's called the amygdala in the brain here, it's the center that goes bananas, ballistic. It's the one that creates all this anxiety because it is not being subdued by other areas of the brain, and that then leads to this uh, hypothalamic pituitary axis. Uh, to release more cortisol and basically that's a stress hormone. Uh, this is about adrenaline being pumped out, cortisol being pumped out and you're always ready uh, and anxious and stressed. So from a neuroanatomical basis you need to try and then subdue the amygdala and neurofeedback to some extent then allows you to do this by activating some parts of the frontal cortex here and part of this frontal part of the brain then tells the amygdala to calm down and that's how you then alleviate much of the stress and depression that you might be feeling. Now this little video that I've got here for you shows you how this in fact can work. So this man here has a, if you can see, a cap on and these little dots there are actually sensors and they from different parts of the brain, they just record your brain electrical activity. And what will happen through the video is, is that the man is going to get some commands, do this, so it'll say relax, and then it'll say, um, you know, don't relax, think of something agitating. And the brain waves that the computer records will lead to these people here in a medical clinic to either sit down if the person is relaxed or get up and talk to the receptionist. Okay, so this is what this um, video is about. So I'll just let me show you this. Bear with me for a minute. It's a, a fantastic um, example of how this can work. So they're recording here from the amygdala. So now he's saying, they're saying, try and relax. So he's thinking meditation, calmness. Have a look at all these people at the counter. And as he's thinking calm thoughts, the people are sitting down. And this is just because the brain waves coming back to the computer. Okay, more theta waves, more alpha waves. Great. Now the instructions is think of something more detrimental. He's, he's getting angry thoughts in his head. Everybody gets up and starts talking to the secretary. So this is a very typical example of how neurofeedback can work. Let me get back to the presentation. Okay, why does breathing work? Well, one thing that many of you probably are aware of is, is that when you do yoga or anything like that, you're always being told breathe in through the nose. It's always breathe in through the nose, breathe out through through the mouth. Sometimes depending on what yoga you're doing, you might be asked to sort of breathe in through the left nostril, breathe out through the right nostril, breathe in through the right nostril, breathe out through the through left 
why are we doing this? Well, the reason is, again, from a scientific perspective, this uh, person here, Cristina Zelano, made this uh, experiment. And what she did is she had people breathing through their nose or through their mouth. And what we've got here is we've got a number of different areas that she looked at. So she looked at the prefrontal cortex, which is the frontal part here. She looked at the amygdala, which is the stress part of your brain. And she also looked at the hippocampus, which is also involved in memory and stress. And what you can see is that when you did the nose breathing, the, the um, blue line right, ends up being in line with your breathing. You see you're breathing in here and the blue line, the electrical activity also goes up in the prefrontal cortex. You can see a similar response in the amygdala and you can see a similar response, pardon me, in the hippocampus. So breathing through your nose seems to have a direct effect on brain activity. If you're breathing in through the mouth, same idea, but you can see that here the electrical activity again in blue there's no response, there's no relationship between your breathing pattern and the electrical activity of the brain. So that's one uh, reason why I'm saying that breathing is very important and can actually relax you, and especially if you're breathing through the nose and if you're into mindfulness, if you're breathing at a particular frequency that's known as resonant frequency, which is usually about six breaths per minute, that will then optimize uh, the calmness of your brain it will become more calm and in fact it will also uh, it has been shown to affect your immune system as well so it improves your immune response and if you do that once or twice a day 10 minutes that's usually considered very helpful and this is what I'm explaining here mindfulness uh, simple health care for their brain so it's basically breathing through the nose breathe out through the mouth this is what you're doing here it's called diaphragmatic breathing and you try and breathe in five seconds. In, so you go one, two, three, four, five. That's your in breath. And then you do the same breathing out. You do that for about five, ten minutes. And um, after a number of days, or even at the s on the day, you know, you do this for ten minutes, you should see or feel a calmness. And one way that you can test this, and I'm pretty sure that works for everybody, is that. If you're a little stressed, you usually end up having cold fingertips. You know, your, temp your, your peripheral um, circulation sort of shuts down a bit and you end up getting cold fingertips. You do this breathing, and you might do yoga or whatever, or the breathing that I just explained to you, well, you'll find within a number of minutes that your fingertips will actually warm up. And that's a sign of relaxation because the reason why the fingertips are cooler is because you have this sympathetic drive, this anxiety, this stress. And the sympathetic nervous system constricts your blood vessels that take blood to your, for instance, fingers. If the sympathetic nervous system activity decreases, your blood vessels become larger, more blood goes down your limbs to your fingertips, and hence your fingertips become warmer. So that's a way of you being able to tell that, oh, wow, you know, I'm getting actually calmer by being aware of your fingertip temperature. Okay, now let's have a look at some of the issues in terms of the brain. So here is a number of examples, for instance, in terms of psychopathology. So here, for instance, we have a healthy control brain, and what we can see here is, again, the various um, brain electrical patterns, so delta band, theta band, alpha, and beta band, and what basically what it tells you is, is that in this uh, person here, this person has, for instance, an internet gaming disorder. What you can see is that there is a very high activity here up the front compared to healthy. We can see this also, for instance, in alcohol use disorder, and we can see here if we're looking at the theta band, uh, which should be a little bit activated here in, in healthy controls in the midline. Well, it's way, way over the top here in alcohol uh, use disorder. So what we note here is, is that, again, depending on the psychopathology, the way that your brain works and uh, changes, and it also about that different parts of the brain end up working slightly different. So you can see here also healthy controls in the alpha band, 
you know, reasonable sum, a little bit of an activity here in green, but again in alcohol use disorder, a lot of this uh, activity here in the middle band and in uh, internet gaming disorder, are slightly similar to healthy controls. This might be shown a little bit better here, and one of the interesting parts here is that you can see here normal, ma mainly green, which is fine, no problems. If you're looking at depression, you can see this overactivity here in the left uh, frontal part of the brain. So this is a very telltale sign of depression. And again here, when you're looking at anxiety, you can again see this very marked increase in activity in the frontal part of the brain and along the midline compared to normal. So what neurofeedback is trying to do is trying to bring these areas that are red back to green. That's what the aim of the game is. So this again shows you in clinic neurofeedback. So if you're going to a clinician, somebody who's experiencing neurofeedback, they usually give you this cap here. And again, the white parts here are the sensors that will be uh, uh, touching your uh, scalp here and from the scalp part we can then see the various uh, bits of electrical activity uh, here you just see the locations uh, along the scalp of the various sensors this is what it looks like on the inside of the scalp and then here is what we will see so in this case this person has a right hand side brain injury you can see here on the right hand side this much more marked red activity. So from these raw signals that we see here, from all the different sites in the, on the scalp, we can then determine or see uh, what in fact and where uh, there may be an abnormality. So now I'd like to talk a little bit more about the use of mobile apps. So it's about, if you go back, remember I was talking about strategies and mechanisms, so it's about coping strategies and preventative interventions. And in this case, I said to support not only vulnerable groups under pandemic conditions, so to support anyone. I think anyone can basically benefit from uh, doing mindfulness, biofeedback, or to some extent also neurofeedback. That's quite easily done using a number of these apps that I'm going to show you now. So. One is called MindLift, uh, it's from, actually the system also can be uh, known as Muse, and it's uh, like a headband that you put on, on your uh, forehead here, and it records your electrical activity here through these sensors that you can see, and if you're relaxed, you are going to um, um, hear some raindrops falling, sort of, you know, rainforest. If you're not relaxed, you'll hear some crackling noises or some other noise. And so again, if you start breathing and you're calming down and you visualize yourself as being sort of meditating on the nice hill in the forest, well then the rain will come back and the brain will start relaxing. And you will also start learning how to do this at any time of day. You don't, after a while you don't need the band because you know what you need to do if you feel stressed or um, uh, anxious. And here are a number of others. There's a device called Mendy. Uh, we also Thought Technologies, one here that can be used. Oops, see, Mendy is good. Thought Technology, not so portable, but certainly Mendy, Muse, uh, again, Brain Paint, not as portable, but certainly for home use. Brainwave, this one here, uh, NeuroSky, again, is uh, portable. Uh, to a large extent because you can use it with uh, you know, your iPad or, or a mobile phone. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit of a result here that we have for what we call NeuroSky. So these are some examples uh, that uh, we've tested and we know uh, work very well in terms of neurofeedback. And here we've got a little bit of a problem. The cache should be up here, but you know, these workers probably a bit stressed, lots of things to do, so they're just marked up here on this heading, so we'll just fix that later. So here is an uh, experiment, a research project that we had at uh, Khalifa University. Uh, Habshi Alkaf helped us with this. He's one of the students at the university. And basically what he's done is he's put this NeuroSky 
uh, headset on the activity, the brain activity is measured here at the front of the brain and what is done is it's just following this particular instruction and the instruction is quite simple it says try to get this ball floating in the air as long as possible and as high as possible and just do that and uh, when, you, when you look at this you think well what can I do you know if I twiddle my thumbs well, nothing's happening you know if I start breathing in a particular way and I start relaxing and I might still be twiddling my thumbs all of a sudden what happens is, is that the ball will start rising and uh, what will happen is, is that this meditation scale here this white bar will move to the right and so you just do this for about 10, 10 minutes you know, twice a day or once a day and you will note that you will get karma and you can see this here where we've looked at this stress index. So he did it for about uh, 10 minutes, how she did it for about 10 minutes, and this was the stress index here was close to 2, normally 0. So he did this for uh, 10 minutes, and what you found here is that after he did this for about 10 minutes, his stress index went to 0.5, so below 1 basically. So he certainly improved, okay, so he became much less stressed doing this uh, NeuroSky neurofeedback for 10 minutes. So that was one of the uh, research activities that we've just recently um, done at Khalifa University. Now, neurofeedback has other positive outcomes, and uh, what I've shown here is that, for instance, it also helps in diabetes. So neurofeedback can lead to a decrease in blood sugar levels over time or HbA1c if you like. And so it has an extended um, outcome. In addition it can also have an effect in blood pressure control. So if you do this breathe, if you have a blood pressure recorder at home, you put it on, you might have a blood pressure of say 130 you do this mindfulness breathing as I was saying or using one of these neurofeedback apps for 10 minutes maybe 20 minutes what you'll find is that your blood pressure will drop and over time the blood pressure will remain lower for the day or longer so you need to do this on a regular basis so it can also then affect uh, and have a positive effect on people with uh, hypertension now the, this, is, this here is again uh, evidence-based neurofeedback um, and this here from the Korean Medical Science basically what it shows you is that neurofeedback improves a whole bunch of um, uh, factors or features if you like so let me just have a bit of a closer look because uh, uh, this is the Hamilton depression scale over time uh, depression scale decrease, so less depression. Uh, we've also got here another depression scale called the back depression scale, again showing the same effect, depression decreased. This one here is interesting because quality of life reported was much better following uh, a time in um, using neurofeedback. And similar here in the Frontiers in Human Neuroscience publication, uh, this was looking at post-traumatic stress disorder, and we know that in post-traumatic stress disorder people re-experience uh, the stressful event, uh, they avoid and they're also hypervigilant at times and what you can see here is, is that after about 60 days uh, when you're looking at the black which was the start line, the baseline, the re-experiences was less, avoidance was less and hypervigilance also decreased. So Neurofeedback certainly has a very strong effect on stress and anxiety. And this is just about now my last slide. I uh, just want to point out a number of uh, research topics that we have here at Khalifa University, uh, mainly led by Leontius Haji Leontiades in uh, biomedical engineering. Uh, we have a number of apps, and one of these that we have is called Type of Mood that you can download, and it will then record type of mood and you can also then through again through breathing you can improve this um, again so type of mood is uh, one that we have and we have a number of other 
research projects that we're looking at at the moment where we can, for instance, also uh, look into the likelihood or the risk of somebody having uh, COVID-19, for instance, infection, because we can now analyze these uh, breath sounds. So breathing sounds and cough sounds are different if you've got the infection, and then we can analyze this and say, okay, there's um, higher risk or lower risk of you having COVID-19. So these are some of the uh, research topics that we have at the moment at Khalifa University. We're also working on uh, others which include uh, mindfulness and biofeedback to improve mental health in the long term. So this brings me to the end of my presentation. I'm happy to take questions if you like. This is my favorite picture. It's from the Horsehead Nebula. And one of the things that's interesting about the Horsehead Nebula is that it only looks like a horse's head when you're looking at it from planet Earth. And the point there is that with COVID-19 and with mental health, it's a good idea to look at the situation from many different perspectives so that we can try and come up with something that helps everybody. Thank you. I'm just going to look at my WhatsApp to see whether uh, any questions are coming through. Okay, so we've got one here. We've got a number here. How can we get rid of anxiety we have when it comes to COVID-19? So I think the most simplest way, thank you for the question, is to really do this mindfulness breathing. I think that's probably the best way. Ten minutes, uh, there's a number of other apps. If you go onto our site, I've talked about biofeedback. I mentioned a number of other apps there for smartphones that you can download and use. That would be a very simple way of reducing your anxiety. And I think we've, we've shown that in a number of uh, researches uh, previously, not necessarily with COVID-19, but in people that have had anxiety. So certainly the Muse is another, uh, when I, you know, from, the, from this perspective, uh, looking at this one here, you can find this on the net, MindLift. This is also a very effective way of reducing anxiety and stress at home. Certainly if you feel very anxious, you know, you should see somebody, you know, you should try and get a telehealth uh, a consultation or see a psychologist, psychiatrist, or in, in the first instance, uh, your general um, physician to help you out with that. But certainly if it's bothering you, this is a good way of dealing with it. Thank you for that question. Do I think that COVID-19 has any positive effects on the world? Well, there's always, uh, I think, you know, the glass half full or half empty. And I think uh, from our university perspective and from what I know in the UAE that has been happening is that many of us in the uh, health community, research community, university community, a lot of us have been working together much more than we ever have before. So in that regard, uh, there's a big, big um, research undertaken at the moment in terms of working out the genetics of the virus and how it infects different people and why some people are more prone to get infection than others. And we have collaborations now with uh, uh, European sites. We collaborate with Sharjah, with Dubai, with Alain, and that's been really fantastic. And I think that type of uh, togetherness and working together, I think, uh, is quite fantastic. And I, I did see something on BBC, which again, I think, was interesting, is where you know people are coming out, they're playing guitar for people, or they're putting on theatre. So there's many people that are now much more, uh, if you like, aware of others, and so where the community get together and help each other out. So I think that's probably a positive effect. Uh, what is the difference between breathing in and out from the left and the right nose? Well, uh, from a yoga perspective, possibly is that if you're breathing in through the ni right nose, it affects more the right-hand side of the brain. If you're breathing in through the left nose, it affects more the uh, left side of the brain. And there are differences in terms of uh, what's happening on the right and what's happening on the left-hand side of the brain. So, for instance, in depression, I was telling you that there's a quite a change in the 
frontal part of the brain uh, in depression, whereas if you're sort of anxious and things, it's more on the right hand side. So that's what uh, that is about. I just lost the screen. Uh, the lady did everything to prevent getting coronavirus, but she still got it. How can we reduce the stress and anxiety when knowing this information? Well, I think it's about being aware uh, um, of, you know, being aware of uh, that this can happen and being aware and knowledgeable what you can do about it. So, for instance, if I know this can happen, if I have slight symptoms, I will go and see a doctor because I won't wait around because I know it can happen and it, it can happen to many and we know that a lot of people in the health services are affected uh, from one way or another because they have a much greater um, um, time, much longer, more often um, in terms of contact with people that have COVID-19 than people in the normal population. So if you live a, you know, a non-health care life, you're not going to be in touch with this many people that have COVID-19 and severe COVID-19, so the likelihood of you getting it is much less. So this is mainly for healthcare workers that are unfortunately sometimes uh, a lot more at risk. Uh, regarding the neurofeedback apps, how can it help us? Well, the neurofeedback, the one that I was, uh, for instance, showing you, this one here, the NeuroSky, it will show you and will help you to relax. It will help you to relax. If you're more relaxed, you'll be less anxious, you'll be less stressed. And uh, the way that you can see this is, is and, and to, that you learn how to relax is by learning what you need to do to get this ball, for instance, to rise up in the air. So if you get, if you, you know, say for instance, um, I have uh, the neurons go on and, uh, and I have very quick breaths <laughs> like this, so you know, anxious breathing, <laughs> I'm really anxious. Well, the ball will not rise and this white graph here, this white bar will not move to the right. If I start slowing my breathing down and breathing through the nose slowly, as slow as I can, consciously, thinking maybe of some, you know, beach, beautiful waves, whatever, then what you'll see is that this um, ball will start rising and the white bar will move to the right. And as I said, to be sure that something actually is happening, that you know something's happening, I would suggest for you to actually touch your, you know, your fingers or hold your fingers to your cheek. If they're cold, you can say, okay, I know I'm anxious and yep, my fingers are cold. Well then try the breathing that I keep telling you about. Do this for 5-10 minutes and then check your fingertips again. And I'm fairly certain that if not immediately, doing this for 10-20 minutes will, will uh, increase your temperature in your fingertips. If it doesn't, do it again because it, it will work. It, it, it pretty much has worked with everybody that I've had in in clinic previously. So that's uh, how that would work. And NeuroSky or Muse will help you get into the rhythm. So the next question was, what are some ways to reduce stress and anxiety when knowing too much information about COVID-19? Well, that's a, <laughs> that's a good question. And I think certainly clinicians and researchers sometimes uh, have this issue and I sometimes feel that as well. I think again it's about being aware and trying to see the information that you get in balance. So I know a lot about the virus, I know a lot about the genetics, I know a lot about the clinical symptoms uh, that can occur, but I also know that if I look after myself, I exercise, I um, wash my hands, I practice social distancing, I don't go into large crowds, then the likelihood of me getting or being infected is very, very low. So if you're looking, uh, for instance, and you want to get information, I would have a look to see a percentage of people actually uh, getting severe COVID-19 symptoms. And that percentage is rather low. 
and so too much information yes can get you but it also depends on the type of information so I think you need to start getting a balanced picture don't just say oh you know I've got so much information about all these countries you know England Spain France everybody Australia Brazil all these numbers well that's one type of information but the other type of information is what are these countries doing about the, the, the pandemic what can I do about it how can I make sure that I stay healthy and again the, the, the simplest things are you eat properly sleep properly try to sleep if you can't do some mindfulness breathing that's my suggestion uh, wash your hands you know like you know when you go out you can um, take off your clothes put them in the washing machine you know so there's a number of these things so try to have a balanced view of the information that you have and the information that you get make sure that it comes from a credible source so I think that's uh, about everything that's all the questions thank you everyone for listening uh, it's been a pleasure uh, providing you with this information and I hope it's been of some help to you if you've got any more questions you can contact uh, Khalifa and I will try to answer any questions then thank you Okay, well, thanks for sending me those questions through. That worked very well. Yeah. And it came out reasonably. Yeah. Just ask him that. That's yeah. my